However, Jay Malosh, an astronomer back in 2001, published a paper where he calculated how many rocks planet Earth would receive over the course of the history of the universe. And what he determined was that planet Earth would receive one rock the size of my fist or bigger. Forget the two meter rock. Let's just go as a small rock the size of my fist. He calculated that planet Earth would receive only one such rock every 10 to the 16 years from other star systems in our galaxy and other galaxies. Well, that's a million times longer than the entire age of the universe, which means that life can't get here through rocks. And I remember at one of the Origin of Life research conferences, one of the scientists getting up, and out of sheer frustration, came to the discussion microphone and said, what we've done at this conference is we've ruled out the possibility of the origin of life on planet Earth, we've ruled it out on Mars, we've ruled it out on the satellites of Jupiter and on Saturn's moon Titan, in fact, the entire solar system, we've ruled it out in these interstellar gas clouds, we've ruled it out on these um, star systems, other planetary systems. It says the only thing that is left is that aliens must have brought life here to planet Earth. And so he proposed, and by the way, he's not the first. Francis Crick, uh, back in 1981, wrote a whole book where he said, we've ruled out all possibilities except the aliens bringing life here to planet Earth. This is called directed panspermia, where scientists speculate that intelligent aliens in a galaxy far, far away sent a spaceship to planet Earth with life on board, and that spaceship deposited life here on planet Earth at several points over the past 3.8 billion years. Uh, but this raises a question. How do you explain the origin of the aliens? If you can't explain the uh, origin of life here on planet Earth or anywhere else in the universe, how on earth can you explain the origin of these aliens? And even if they were to exist, how could they possibly travel through interstellar space? It's not that easy to move a spaceship across interstellar distances, and this is a theme we took up in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, that it's actually, you would actually violate the laws of physics in attempting to transport life across interstellar space. The distances are too great, and the exposure to radiation and debris that you've got to pass through is such that that life can't possibly survive. So what are we left with? Well, a number of atheists and agnostics acknowledge these problems and say the only explanation for the origin of life here on planet Earth are hidden laws of physics. And so they say there must be this fourth law of physics, and it's that fourth law of physics uh, that explains the origin of life on planet Earth, and that life suddenly appears uh, through the operation of this law of physics. However, this law of physics directly contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. And if that second law is contradicted, there's no possibility for physical life anywhere. And so the theme we brought up in our book, uh, Origins of Life, is that the only explanation is really the biblical explanation that it is an alien, but it's an alien beyond space and time. And an alien who purposely put life here on planet Earth and uh, supernaturally uh, planted that life here. Well, let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about the most complex aspect uh, of this creation evolution debate, and that would be the evolution of man. Now in this cartoon I have up here, you'll notice that you have uh, life uh, progressing from uh, that primitive bipedal primate uh, that's on your left and progressing to that advanced character on the right. And uh, you know, this is, uh, by the way, choose whatever sports bias you want. You don't have to put a football player there. Feel free to put a hockey player and whatever else you want to put at the front end. Um, but I show this because this is the most common evolutionary explanation, that human beings are here as a direct result of evolving naturally from more primitive uh, species of life. Well, there's a famous evolutionary biologist, Francisca Ayala, that several years ago uh, decided to critique the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life by calculating from optimistic Darwinian perspective what is the probability that you would start with bacteria? Bacteria are the simplest life forms you see on planet Earth. They're the first life that uh, showed up on planet Earth 3.8 billion years ago. Start with bacteria 
and let's calculate the probability under the assumption that these evolutionary mechanisms are extremely efficient uh, that you'd wind up with human beings or their equivalent. And the point that Francisca Ayala was making is that naturalistic evolution can go any number of a random different directions that doesn't necessarily have to proceed in a direction that would produce human beings or their equivalent. And he says, even if Darwinian evolution is extremely efficient, as efficient as anyone would imagine, the probability you'd wind up with human beings is less than one chance in 10 to the millionth power. However, Francisco Ayala neglected to factor in that planet Earth changes over the billions of years, as does the universe and the solar system. And if you take that into account, the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 24 million. And you say, what does that probability look like? It's equivalent to the probability that you would win the California lottery three million consecutive times where you buy just one ticket each time, which is a probability that is not distinguishable from winning the California lottery three million consecutive times where you don't buy any tickets at all. And so this puts a big damper on the human evolutionary idea from a naturalistic perspective. But let me just spend a minute on what the Bible says about the origins of humanity. Uh, it tells us that Adam and Eve are the last of God's creation miracles and that Adam and Eve are the only spirit beings God created on planet Earth. Now, what we've done in our book of Who is Adam, and it's also in Creationist Science, is to calibrate the Genesis genealogies to come up with a date for when God created Adam and Eve. And that date is 50,000 years ago, give or take 20,000 years. And interestingly, that biblical creation date for the human species of 50,000 years ago is consistent with what we see as the cultural big bangs. Namely, that when we look at the bipedal primates that preceded human beings, we don't see any language use. We don't see jewelry, we don't see clothing, and we don't see advanced tools, art, or music. But as soon as human beings show up, we see this sudden explosion of clothing use, of tools uh, for that clothing use, and other advanced tools, uh, jewelry, and it's such that the jewelry is far more numerous uh, than the tools. These are all markers for Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, contrasted with the bipedal primates that preceded us. As we explain in Who is Adam, and also in Creationist Science, we now have genetic tools for putting these human creation models to the test. Mitochondrial DNA traces what happens to the human species on the female side. And we're able to test whether or not the human species is descended from one woman or many women from one place or many locations. And the answer is we are descended from one woman, one place. Now the date that we gain uh, from this study places that first woman at 150,000 years ago. But that is assuming that no one in the human species experiences heteroplasmy or triplasmy, which means we either get two or three sets of this mitochondrial DNA rather than one set. And when you take that into account, you wind up with a date of 50,000 years ago. And indeed, 10% of the population experiences heteroplasmy, 1% triplasmy, and that gives you a date of 50,000 years. On the male side, we can use the Y chromosome, and this gives us a date of 42,000 to 56,000 years uh, for that first man, and again confirms we're descended from one man, one, one place. In fact, in the scientific literature, they refer to these new discoveries as confirming the uh, Garden of Eden hypothesis. They actually recognize uh, that these new discoveries are consistent what the Bible teaches about uh, human origins. And perhaps the most remarkable thing to come out of these DNA studies is that when we isolate stable populations, what we notice is that you consistently get a younger date, an, a later date for the first man than you do the first woman. And this is referred to in the scientific literature as the younger Adam paradox how the first man seems to show up thousands of years later than the first woman. But this is exactly what you would predict from a biblical perspective, because the Bible tells us that the entire human race is descended from eight people that were on board Noah's Ark. 
four men and four women. But there's a big difference, according to the Bible, between the men and the women. The men are all blood-related to one man, Noah. It's Noah and his three sons. And therefore, from a biblical perspective, we would predict a Y-chromosome DNA bottleneck, not at Adam, but rather at Noah. The entire male species uh, had, can trace back their Y-chromosome, according to the Bible, to that single man, Noah.